coming up on Lawmakers. The House passes controversial legislation requiring the use of a photo ID at the polls. Reaction to Governor Sonny Perdue's State of the State Address, what was included and what was left unsaid. And the House halved heating tax. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, Gerald Bryant and Wandy Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also coming up on Lawmakers, Senate Republicans vote to change a Senate district. Democrats cry foul. And Georgia vets have their say about the quality of veterans' hospital care. But our lead story tonight, the ongoing debate over the photo ID legislation. Well, the House passed a new version of voter ID today. Supporters of Senate Bill 84 believe the judge who deemed parts of last year's voter ID legislation unconstitutional will find this version acceptable. House Bill 244 passed last year, and many who opposed it then continue to fight the new version. David Zelsky joins us live with some background on the old and new voter ID bills. David. Well, Gerald, the bill supporters believe offering a free voter ID card for any registered voter who doesn't already have acceptable ID, acceptable ID is an important step to reduce voter fraud. However, Democrats believe this new bill still tampers with people's constitutional rights. The opposition to voter ID bills during the 2005 session prompted some of the same arguments we are hearing today. There's no other state in America that has as restrictive laws pending as it relates to voting as Georgia. All the thing they are doing is denying access to all of the folks, elderly folks in nursing homes, folks who don't have driver's license now. They are telling them you got to get a photo ID. Why are we sending young men and young women to die for the right to vote in faraway land? We seek to inflict mortal wounds on our right to vote here in Georgia. Yes. There was some discussion about making these bills a little bit better. Tweak them a little bit. Uh -huh. Let me tell you, poison is poison. Uh -huh. You can't make poison uh, nectar. You can't make it juice. It's poison. We've got to kill Senate Bill 84 yes. and House Bill 244. Yesterday in the House Rules Committee, Representative Calvin Smyre voiced more of the same on a revised Senate Bill 84. Somebody give me the case to the rationale, the reasoning for the bill. Somebody show me. When we introduce legislation, there's a reason and there's a rationale. Nobody can give a case study for this bill. However, Representative Barry Fleming, who is carrying the bill in the House, believes this type of identification is what the majority of Georgians want. One thing that I do know for sure, though, uh, Representative Porter, is that if we pass this bill, we'll have better security at the polls. Uh, than we did before we passed it, and that's our goal today. But we don't know that we don't have security now, because we're now throwing money at a problem that really doesn't exist, or no documented reason to know it exists. Like I said, I think it probably has gone on forever, and people will probably attempt to do it in the future. I guarantee you probably sometime in the past, somebody has grabbed a water bill and walked in and probably said they were John Smith and tried to vote for him. Now, did we catch them in the past? Maybe we didn't. But what I do know in the future, with this voter ID card, the likelihood of that happening will be much less. No, Senate Bill 84 passes the Senate. Many Democrats believe a judge will again find it unconstitutional, just like House Bill 244 from last year. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, David. Meanwhile, after more than three hours of debate preceded the passage of voter ID legislation, with many Democratic opponents to the bill decrying it as discriminatory to minorities and senior citizens. Representative Barry Fleming pointed out that one House member had been elected under the previous election identification code. Gwen Everson, one of our newest House members, obviously he's here today with us, was elected in Gwinnett County, not only in a special election to fill Phyllis Miller's seat, but also in a runoff. And there were zero problems with people going to the polls and showing uh, their ID. Also on the Senate side, right in my area in Augusta, Senator Ed Tarver was elected and we did not have problems in the Augusta area uh, with people having to show their ID when they went to the poll. So we've had an example of how this already works well and this bill makes it even easier to go through the process. What I do appreciate about the process of discussing this of this bill is we now know exactly who is targeted under this. And under last session, I think several groups felt targeted, but now we know. 
The one that will be most affected by this than any others are our elderly, those who have voted forever, because those are the ones who had the most problem this past time uh, in this implementation. The House did agree to a single amendment requiring the State Board of Elections to provide training and maintenance for the new ID equipment. The House Committee, to, the House Committee substitute to Senate Bill 84 passed the House by a vote of 110 to 64, with votes mostly along party lines. The Senate must now decide whether to agree to the changes, and we will bring you extended coverage of today's debate in the second half of our show. In other news, Governor Sonny Perdue delivered his fourth State of the State address yesterday, and advocates and lawmakers alike are still buzzing about which issues he chose to include. Education funding was at the forefront of his speech, and lawmakers Jesse Freeman joins us live now with more on the governor's agenda. Jesse. Well, Gerald, education funding was exactly what everyone was talking about today, but that's not to say there weren't plenty of other clues given about what the governor will work on this year. Transportation and infrastructure are high on the list. Protecting our children from sexual predators was, was one of his top priorities. We're going to do things on eminent domain to restrict what governments can do on taking personal property. The governor has that as one of his initiatives, and that's very important to the legislature. The governor also talked about business infrastructure and technology in particular. Senator Mitch Sebaugh is the chair of the Senate Regulated Industries Committee. Well, technology is basically the... Um, is at the fulcrum of us being able to grow industry in the state of Georgia. And we go out and try to attract industry to come to Georgia, which is what we want to do. We want to bring jobs to Georgia. That helps our economy. It's more revenue. It lets us to do more things. Governor Purdue also set a goal in his speech of boosting Internet access for all Georgians. When you look at other nations and you see how they are, their take rates are much higher. For us to compete in a worldwide economy, we have got to increase our take rate. So the governor has, has seen that and is looking to take some one Georgia money and, and trying to invest that in rural Georgia to really help them in increasing those take rates. But the bulk of the speech was about education and reactions were split across party lines. We clearly uh, need to make education our priority and because of the fact that we are competing with the world and only if we have an educated populace will we be able to compete effectively with the world. The governor has been cutting education for three years. Uh, teachers' pay was just frozen at nothing, and they had a 13% increase in their health benefits last year. There's widespread dissatisfaction across the state, and I guess the governor realizes he's been on the wrong side of the issue of supporting education for Georgia. Now, in addition to funding increases, the governor also talked about his initiative to attract high-performance principals to low-performing schools. His budget proposes $3 million for that program. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you, Jesse. Also in the state of the state, the governor thanked the House yesterday for passing a bill to cut the tax on heating fuel by 2 percent. House Bill 970 extends the governor's executive order to allow the tax cuts to continue through March for propane and through April for natural gas. Presenting the bill yesterday, the governor's floor leader said the measure would greatly assist Georgians, but many other legislators argued that this was only a Band-Aid solution for the state's over energy overconsumption. Bottom line is the state of Georgia over the last year has seen the natural gas propane prices double due to circumstances that we had no control over. There was a lot of natural disasters, an act of God. We had hurricanes. We had a lot of bad weather that's come through the state, which in essence drove the price up. And we're not going to profit on the backs of our taxpayers with a windfall and that's what we're doing. We're giving back this windfall to the people of the state of Georgia. This is a great campaign bumper, bumper sticker. I cut the tax on your heating bill. But this is no solution for Georgia families. And I'll tell you, when you go back home, and I did this the other night in a neighborhood meeting, how many people here, I asked them, are worried about your heating bill? And some 80% stuck their hands up. And when they come with a 2% tax relief, tax cut on a bill that's going to amount to a handful of dollars, it's going to be, it's going to be meaningless. House Bill 970 passed by a vote of 169 to 2 and is now in the Senate.
State Senator Judson Hill wants to make it harder for the legislature to raise taxes. The Marietta Republican has filed a bill that requires a two-thirds majority in both houses to approve a tax increase. If passed, the Hill legislation would be on the ballot in November as a constitutional amendment. Voters could then approve or vote down the proposal. Several other states already have a supermajority requirement to raise taxes. And in the state Senate today, they voted to put Clark County into two senatorial districts instead of one. Senator Ralph Hudgens, sponsor of the bill, said it would give Athens-Clark County more equitable representation in the General Assembly. The Athens-Clark County Chamber of Commerce is asking that, they, that their representation in both the House and the Senate be increased to as large a number as possible. Now, the reason they're doing this, if you look at the last page in your handout, this is the 20 largest counties in the state of Georgia. If you look down, Clark County is number 14. Clark County has one senator representing it. If you take the 13 counties that are larger than Clark and you add that total number up, you come up with 45 senators represent those 13 counties. You divide 45 by 13, you come with 3.46 senators per county. Clark County says, we want more representation in the halls of the General Assembly. Senate Democrats said Republicans only wanted to change District 46 to make it harder for a Democrat to win. Representative Jane Kidd of Athens has announced she's going to run there. Senator David Edelman said the map changes would make it impossible for Representative Keith Hurd to run in District 46. There is a member of the Georgia House of Representatives a minority member, African-American member of the Legislative Black Caucus, a potential candidate for the Georgia State Senate from Senate District 46, who is being drawn out of Senate District 46. The representative that you cite uh, has not made any sort of public announcement indicating his intent to run for the Georgia Senate. Is that correct? Shoot, I don't know. I don't know. What I, what I, it's my understanding that there is a representative, a member of the Black Caucus, who currently resides in the 46th State Senate District, who, if this bill passes and becomes uh, the law, will no longer reside in the 46th District. So I call him a potential candidate for the State Senate, and I think that's fair. So there is, in fact, no evidence whatsoever that this person that you cite has any intent for running for higher office or the state senate at all. Is that correct? <laughs> I think being in the state house from athens Clark County makes you a potential candidate for the state senate. I talked with Representative Keith Hurd. He said he had been considering running, running in Senate District 46, but now he can't. The Senate passed the map changes by a vote of 34 to 18. The bill goes to the House. Meanwhile, the Senate redistricting plan was the subject of a morning order on the House floor. Representative Jane Kidd told her colleagues that the measure is aimed at keeping her out of the Senate. We all know what's happening here. I declared that I was running for this Senate seat last May. This seat currently is almost equally balanced in party performance. Senator Kemp's brother-in-law, whom I defeated in my House race, has declared to run for this Senate race. This is the kind of political gerrymandering that Governor Perdue railed against when it was done by another administration. The current districts were drawn by the courts and duly passed by the Georgia General Assembly, just as Perdue demanded it be done. And now when the political winds look like someone from the other party might be elected, they want to draw, redraw the district to split Clark County. Now our nightly reminder for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch lawmakers online. Visit our website at gpb.org for more information. Click on Watch Online, then follow the instructions for watching live or looking at past lawmaker programs in our archives. That website address again is gpb.org, just another way we keep you apprised of what's going on at the Georgia General Assembly. We'd like to recommend another website that's a valuable resource for information about the Georgia General Assembly. Go to www.legis.state.ga.us. That website is a great research tool that we at lawmakers use on a regular basis. Earlier, we gave you a recap of some of the major points of Governor Sonny Perdue's State of the State Address. Of course, what was not mentioned can be just as important as what was. And for a report on some of those conspicuously absent issues, here's lawmakers Jesse Freeman. 
In his fourth State of the State address, Governor Sonny Perdue left little doubt about what he wanted to forefront. And we will begin with our top priority, education. Now that revenue's there, I think he showed his commitment to education. The governor has, I think, made a bold move in, in, in funding education. The governor also talked about infrastructure and business investment, as well as the war in Iraq. But almost as telling was what he left out of the speech. Democrats have their opinions. I think we really uh, need to work in Georgia for open government and a transparent process. The peach care issue and these things that relate directly to our children, uh, to that segment of our community, we, we felt those were not covered adequately. But what about the issues that were supposed to be on the governor's docket? Purdue did not even bring up the issue of immigration, but that's probably more of a Senate leadership agenda. However, Purdue also did not bring up his Hope Chest initiative. Basically, it's a constitutional amendment. The people of Georgia will have a chance to say, hey, we want Hope scholarships for Hope programs and for pre-K programs, nothing else. Last year, the governor pushed his Faith and Family Services Amendment that would allow nonprofit faith groups to receive public funds. He did not mention it this year. Frankly, he's testing the political waters. Uh, we know we have a lot of priorities this year, and we were trying to see what happens when we pass some of these, uh, the first pieces of legislation, and I think he's got to see how those things happen and uh, uh, see if we can build the, the necessary uh, constitutional minority to, to have a constitutional amendment. What the Hope Chest and faith-based initiatives have in common is that they both exist as resolutions. That means they would require a two-thirds majority in the legislature as well as a majority of a public vote to become law. That means they could be more difficult to get through and also more contentious. At the Capitol, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. As we reported at the top of the show, the House today approved a measure requiring voters to present a photo ID at the polls. The House version of Senate Bill 84 allows county registrars to issue voter IDs free of charge to those who do not have other forms of photo ID. In more than three hours of discussion, opponents to that bill argued that it addresses a problem that does not exist and that it disenfranchises minorities and the elderly. Here's a sampling of today's debate. Since 1996, there has not been one reported case of voter fraud due to misidentification. Now, the examples that have been used about vacant houses and ballots sent, every one of those were because of absentee ballots requested for addresses. That's where the fraud has occurred, and this bill does absolutely nothing to cure that. And you know why we're not dealing with absentee ballots? I can tell you why. I'm a former chairman of the Democratic Party of Georgia. You know why we don't deal with absentee ballots? Because it's the machine of the parties, of both parties. You won't see a bill up here on absentee ballots. I want to show you, just for a second, these pictures up here. It's my good friend, Representative Fleming, who's showing this voter ID card. This is the real voter ID card that they processed. And I wish you could see it, and I'll pass it around if you want to see it, but Atlanta is spelled wrong on here. So you see, if something is left off of my voter card when I go to the polls, I could be denied the access to the ballot because of somebody else's mistake of spelling something wrong. And then I want to show you that all of these cards down here are Governor, Debbie Buckner. We've got a lot of different cards that have been reproduced on somebody else's computer. So this is about protecting the integrity of the voting process. Why then would we incorporate a system that could be duplicated on somebody's home computer? This is not about identifying a vote to vote. This is about identifying those folks who vote majority Democratic and you're trying to keep them from the polls to vote. And it just so happened that the majority of them are people who look like me. Despite what some may claim, this is not a racial issue. Even the NAACP in certain parts of this country requires ID, photo ID, in his election of officers. The political fix in the form of litigation mitigation is not going to work. Restrictions on voting are a matter of law. And most of you, all of you, have a respect for the law. If you've never been denied, you don't understand. 
You don't, you don't understand that when I grew up and I went with my father and my mother, who were both professional educators, and we went to do business, and people refused to give them the respect of calling them by their name other than calling them by their first name. You don't understand that. You don't understand that my mother, who was a professional, who stood in the classroom and taught children every day, could not freely exercise her right to vote until she was over 40 years old. Have the ID, vote absentee, vote absentee. Let the next governor of this state stay up for two days and figure out who the next governor is because they got to count the absentee ballots. Representative Barry Fleming wrapped up the debate by assuring the House that the state's provisional ballot law would prevent anyone from being turned away from the polls. Then he yielded his remaining time to Representative Melvin Everson, whose election in a special election last fall was secured uh, even though there was the voter ID law in place. Those days, vividly I remember those days when there were those in this General Assembly who fought against African Americans to have a right to vote. And I may add, those individuals were of a different party. I want you to know that. What I'm hearing in my district is they believe the voter ID bill and this proposal to make it available and free to anyone who doesn't have one is a great step forward to ensure fair and honest election. Again, the House substitute to Senate Bill 84 passed by a vote of 110 to 64 and it now moves to the Senate. The Senate Veterans Affairs Committee got an earful of complaints today about Georgia VA hospitals. Members of the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars told lawmakers about six months waiting list, enormous medical bills, and some rude employees. Several vets said that many people just don't seem to respect older servicemen. For all that our veterans have given, they deserve nothing less than the best care and the highest courtesy and the deepest respect we can provide to them. Chairman of the committee, John Douglas, said the committee would investigate some witness allegations of drug abuse among employees in hospitals. Representatives of Congressman Lynn Westmoreland and Senator Saxby Shambliss were also present at the meeting. They assured vets that their offices would try to secure more money to expand Georgia's VA hospitals. Also today, the House Judiciary Committee passed a bill that would suspend the power of eminent domain in the state of Georgia for 90 days. House Bill 960 was introduced by Representative Steve Davis because of a legal battle concerning the location of the town hall in the city of Stockbridge. This bill is, is sweet and it's short. It's, it's a simple 120-day moratorium on the use of eminent domain done under the Urban Redevelopment Act or any condemnations done in conjunction with an urban redevelopment plan. And uh, this is in response to, to several uh, abuses statewide, and uh, most notably the one in the city of Stockbridge. The Supreme Court, That's correct. through the state bar, correct. and through the standards mm -hmm. and, and the uh, code of professional responsibility, That's right. which applies to all members of the bar. That's right. Other bills discussed in the House Judiciary Committee included House Bill 804, an act intended to change Georgia laws on frivolous lawsuits, and Senate Bill 153, which would change public record policies at 10 of Georgia's state colleges and universities. Senator Greg Goggins introduced legislation today that establishes a registry for parents and schools to register children's email addresses in order to protect them from inappropriate content. Senator Goggins calls Senate Bill 425 the Georgia Child, Family, and School Communication Protection Act. A person shall not send, cause to be sent, or conspire with a third party to send a message to a contact point that has been registered with the state if the primary purpose of that message is to advertise or induce the sale or use of a product or services that a minor is prohibited by law from purchasing, viewing, possessing, participating in, or otherwise receiving. This bill, if we can pass into law, will limit our children's access and exposure to alcohol, to tobacco, to gambling, pornography, and other products deemed by the state to be illegal to provide to minors. 
this bill, in my opinion, and I want to personally uh, congratulate the uh, senator from Coffee for bringing this to our attention. Uh, it's got total support in the Senate. It's similar to the bill we passed several years ago about no call on telephones. Uh, it protects the, the family, and I think it goes a long way. Senate Bill 425 has bipartisan support. In fact, all 56 senators have signed on to that bill. Senator Jeff Mullis asked for a moment of silence in the Senate today to honor four flyers who died in a Navy jet crash in Walker County. Senator Mullis' district, the Navy T-39 Sabre jet, was flying from Chattanooga to Pensacola. The crash site was discovered late yesterday. These four men were in a training exercise where they flew at high speeds 500 feet off the ground in a mountainous region. And of course, you can imagine in North Georgia, there are plenty of beautiful mountains to train in. But unfortunately, we lost the lives of four brave military men in this training exercise. I'd like to commend a few agencies that were instrumental in the, the um, rescue or recovery of uh, the aircraft and the victims. From the Walker County Emergency Services with Chief Randy Kemp, and Chief McClure and, and other brave men and women in the emergency services with Floyd Emergency Management in Gordon County Emergency Services, as well as Walker County Sheriff's Department and Mark Stansfield and Officers Rogers in Battle, Georgia uh, Emergency Management Agency, Georgia Forestry, Georgia State Patrol, and Georgia Department of Natural Resources. This plane was actually uh, found by the Georgia State Patrol Aviation. So we really hold them in high esteem and we appreciate their great service. Mr. President, if it'd be appropriate, if we could have a moment of silence for these brave men, I would appreciate it. Members of the Senate, please stand. The Senator from the 53rd will lead us and close us in a moment of silence. Thank you. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, we'll have the highlights of the 21st annual Capitol Tribute honoring the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We'll also take a look back at the first week of the 2006 Georgia General Assembly. All that and more tomorrow night at 7 on Lawmakers. Coming up Monday on Georgia Public Broadcasting, don't miss the special presentation of that Capitol Tribute to Dr. King. Martin Luther King Jr., a Capitol Remembrance, will be broadcast Monday, January 16th at 7 p.m. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning morning when lawmakers repeats at 5:30 a.m. Now stay tuned for Ask This Old House that's coming up next here on GPB. And again the King Day celebration at the Capitol will be held tomorrow also the Senate and House both are meeting it was expected today that the House was going to immediately transmit the voter ID bill to the right. Senate in fact the Senate came back at about two o'clock in the afternoon with that expectation meanwhile the debate there was 30 more minutes to go of debate so that we had so to, the, have to stand by <laughs> the Senate finally adjourned for the day so it's possible that the voter ID bill could end up in the Senate tomorrow and we could have lengthy debate there that is our broadcast for this the fourth legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Gerald Bryan. And I'm in Wadi Lawson. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.